Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. It's about noon here exactly on the East Coast. Uh, it's actually a nice warm day out here in Baltimore, 50 degrees. Uh, I'm actually upstairs at the uh, Babe Ruth birthplace. Um, so uh, I know we're a week late since we usually do the third Wednesday of the month, but um, thanks for uh, our speaker being willing to switch. Um, we are recording this, so anybody who misses will be able to view it later. Uh, just to remind everybody tonight, for those who are interested, uh, the Babe Ruth Virtual Birthday Bash continues. Tonight is the panel on Babe Ruth with Jane Levy, uh, Bill Jenkinson, and other experts. Um, and then will be the panel with Brooks Robinson, Jim Palmer, Boot Powell on the 1970 Orioles uh, team. And I'll put the link in the chat um, in a few minutes to make sure everybody, you guys have it. Um, Dan Taylor is joining us from the West Coast. Um, he can tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, so much earlier out there. Um, I, so I, I know the time difference. Um, so uh, I'll let him introduce himself, his, his story, his background, and his book. And uh, I'll be here if you guys need anything. Take away, Dan. Well, thanks. It's great to be with all of you. Uh, uh, I'm Dan Taylor. Uh, been in, uh, this is my fourth book, and uh, uh, my background is in media. I was a sportscaster out here in Fresno for 30 years and have been part of the television team with uh, our local minor league club that has been in the Pacific Coast League up until this year, the Fresno Grizzlies. And I've enjoyed uh, plunging into baseball history as a Sabre member and um, participant in the bio project. Uh, uh, I've certainly enjoyed uh, the biographies and the players that I've gotten to know and, and the stories I've been able to tell. It's a treat for me to, uh, as big a treat for me to talk to you about the Hollywood stars as it was to research and write about the Hollywood stars, a team that, that actually played a role in driving Major League Baseball to Baltimore and uh, a team that, that the babe himself would come out and, uh, and, and watch play when he made his uh, periodic visits out to Los Angeles. Uh, the Hollywood stars, there were two different versions of the Hollywood stars. Uh, this book, Lights, Camera, Fastball, which will be out in about three weeks, uh, uh, focuses on the Hollywood stars that played from 1938 through the 1957 season in the Pacific Coast League. And I think to most of us, and, and really to most baseball enthusiasts, when you hear the name Hollywood stars, you think of the celebrity team, the team that was followed by the movie stars. And indeed, on any given night, uh, you had uh, the biggest names in the motion picture industry uh, sitting in the boxes there at Gilmore Field. Players uh, that I interviewed for this book all shared that when they joined the club, one of the things they were most shocked about was to find that, that uh, Jimmy Stewart and Bing Crosby and Groucho and Harpo Marx were uh, as big a fans of them as they were uh, of these uh, entertainment stars. Uh, and how often were they there? Well, Groucho Marx's son said that uh, he spent so many nights at Gilmore Field with his father that it wasn't until he was an adult that he learned that dinner was supposed to be more than a hot dog, a bag of peanuts, and a soft drink. But they were there every night. It was really a remarkable setting. And this, they were involved in many, many war more ways than just ticket buying or box seat owning fans. Uh, a number of them were, were invo in, involved in the ownership group. Uh, Bing Crosby uh, was a part owner, uh, Barbara Stanwyck, uh, and on and on and on. There was a, num a number of them. They, they would actually, uh, uh, Clark Gable, Barbara Stanwyck, uh, and others would actually hand out the bats to the kids uh, on bat day at Gilmore Field. Uh, Bill Frawley, who you may remember as Fred Mertz on I Love Lucy, uh, he was an investor and he constructed, uh, you know, with his own hands, a, uh, uh, a case where they showcase the player of the year each season, kind of a Hall of Fame case for the ball club. And then during World War II, he built a, a wall of honor in the stadium where they displayed the names of all the Hollywood Stars players who were off uh, fighting in the war. And I think the whole select and, and for the players, it, it, it got them opportunities to be in motion pictures. Uh, most of the baseball films you see from the Stratton story on through to the Jackie Robinson story, uh, Hollywood stars players served as the extras. Uh, 
in the Hollywood in, in the Jackie Robinson film, it was actually shot uh, in the Stars Ballpark Gilmore Field. So uh, players had unique experiences. Irv Noren shared a story with me that, and the guy has really caught on to the business of, of uh, motion pictures. Um, Irv Noren shared the story that uh, the final day of filming uh, for a particular motion picture, uh, he was called on at the end of the day to make a throw from center field to third base. Well, he intentionally airmailed the throw high over the third baseman's head. The reason for that was they were getting paid by the day. So by botching the scene, they had to come back another day and, and complete the scene and the players all got one more day's pay. But I think the, the whole celebrity element has overshadowed really the true legacy of the Hollywood stars. And, and that is, is one of the most innovative teams in baseball history. Uh, on opening day in uh, 1940, uh, they televised their game, and they were the first minor league team to do so, and actually the first team outside of New York City to televise a ball game. The, uh, the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers had each televised a game in September of 1939, and uh, Hollywood uh, televised their opener in 1940 on March 30th, and there were only 300 sets in Los Angeles at that time. And it was an experimental uh, station that, that carried the game. And 20 miles to the south in the, in the community of Long Beach, uh, a set was set in the uh, window of a store. And so many people gathered to watch the Hollywood Stars game that, that the crowd spilled into the street and blocked traffic. And police actually had to come and, and break it up. And uh, when the Stars learned about that, when their management learned about that, they elected to do several more games in 1940 and again in 1941. But television then went on hiatus during the war. Uh, they were the first team to fly. Uh, the American League and the National League did not want their teams, uh, the big league teams flying. They were concerned that a, uh, an air accident would wipe out an entire ball club. And uh, they didn't want their teams flying. But uh, Hollywood, uh, not only were they flying while everybody in the minor leagues was either in station wagons, buses, or on trains, but Hollywood was flying by uh, charter air up to Seattle and, and to Portland and also to the San Francisco Bay Area uh, for their games. Uh, so it was it was a... Uh, way ahead of their, their time in the things that they were doing. Uh, of course, in 1950, they made a lot of news by uh, breaking out a new type of uniform, uh, short pants. And I think what's been lost in all the attention the short pants have been given was that the, the jersey, rather than a flannel, was just a thin t-shirt. And uh, Fred Haney, the manager at the time, introduced it. He was kind of uh, responding to a column uh, by one of the LA Times columnists who, who kind of prodded the team to do something innovative with a uniform. And so Haney had the idea to, to go with shorts and a, and a t-shirt for the top. And he, and the players were really unhappy. The bat boy shared the story with me and Chuck Stevens, who was one of the players also shared that a lot of the guys were really angry. And, and I asked the bat boy, Sandy Oster, who in particular was the angriest that he said, well, the guys with the worst legs uh, were pretty ticked off about it. But uh, Chuck Stevens was the first hitter of the day, the first game they wore the, the, the new uniform. And he beat out an infield hit and Haney had tried to sell the uniform to his players on that. It was lighter and would make them faster. And so when the Stevens the first hitter of the game beat out an infield hit, Haney turned to the stands. He was coaching first base. He turned to the stands, raised his arms and said, see, look what I told you. It works. And they wore the shorts for about two and a half seasons, but a lot of the, the players Haney liked his teams to run hit and run. Uh, and, the players were complaining that their legs were getting torn up. And so finally uh, Haney backed off and, and they stopped wearing the shorts, but it was a big draw up and down the coast league. Uh, the crowds came out to see it in every city that the stars went to. Uh, one of the other unique things was uh, we see in baseball today, both minor league and major league clubs, each season, it's kind of a marketing deal. They introduce a new unique gourmet food item. Well, the Hollywood stars started that back in the forties. Uh, they began with a simple bag of peanuts, but they were heated and they had a prize in the bag. Uh, then they, the next year, it was a uh, hot, fresh made donuts. And then uh, the th year after that, it was the electrocuted Frankfurter. And every year they were trying something new and unique that way. Where did this all come from? Who was the instigator? Who was behind it all? Well, it was a guy who has probably touched your life and you don't even realize it. And he was certainly a guy who played a part in big league baseball coming to Baltimore. His name's Bob Cobb. And Bob Cobb at that time was the owner and operator of the most famous restaurant in the world, the Brown Derby in Hollywood. And how did he touch your life? Well, he was the creator of the Cobb salad. 
so yeah, baseball guy had a hand in creating something that is in just about every restaurant in, in America today. Uh, but Bob Cobb brought the philosophies that he employed with his restaurant to the ball club. Uh, his restaurants were a mecca for the celebrities. Uh, his primary one at Hollywood and Vine, he ended up with four, but the primary one at Hollywood and Vine was on the same street with a lot of the studios. So movie stars and directors would fill the place at lunch and, and also at dinner. And uh, Cobb learned that celebrities would not complain if they were unhappy. They simply would never come back. And he took that to the ball club. Everything was about quality and cleanliness and, and people. And I've often wondered, you know, he employed a team, a small army, uh, to navigate the, the, the interior and exterior of, of the ballpark during games, cleaning up, uh, sweeping up uh, uh, cigarette butts and wrappers and dropped cups and whatnot. And I've often wondered because Walt Disney was an original box seat owner. And I've often wondered if, uh, if that concept, uh, the cleanliness concept is something that, that he took from Gilmore Field when he brought it to his theme parks years later. Um, and Cobb was all about creating unique, a unique environment for the celebrities. Uh, years and years before we saw it at the major league level in all sports, Cobb had a VIP lounge uh, in Gilmore Field. Uh, Pre-game, he had a band playing, he had an open bar, and he had a buffet. Uh, the box seats that they constructed at their ballpark, Gilmore Field, uh, had a backing and siding. They were patterned after the Hollywood Park racetrack and, and the Hollywood Bowl Entertainment Complex and were very different from what we were seeing in, in ballparks at that time. Cobb bought the club. The club had moved in from San Francisco for the 38th season and failed miserably. They struggled to draw people. Their owner uh, had major uh, business problems and, and was going bankrupt. And it was a distress sale. And uh, uh, Cobb had the opportunity to, to jump in and buy the club. And he immediately phoned a number of his celebrity friends. And that's how that ownership group came together. The first call went to Cecil B. DeMille, who jumped at the opportunity, uh, then Bing Crosby, and on and on and on. And, and he had around 20 of these celebrities. So they each bought, were allowed to buy one share at $7,500 a piece. And they raised $200,000. There were some leaders in the business community who got involved as well. And with that money, 40,000 went to buy the ball club. 50,000 was put aside to buy players and improve the team. And then 100,000 went to match 100, excuse me, 100,000 put up by an oil man, Earl Gilmore. And the 10,000 seat ballpark Gilmore Field was constructed on Gilmore's land. Um, the ownership group, you know, they, they, they did change over the years. But uh, as I said earlier, they were extremely involved in, uh, in the club. Uh, one of the key things that they did out of the, out of the gate was to buy, the, the second player they bought uh, was Babe Herman, uh, the former great big league hitter with the Dodgers and other clubs. And Cobb understood through his movie star connections, he understood star power, the whole Paramount uh, theater, whole Paramount studio concept. And by bringing in Babe Herman, he brought instant credibility to that ball club. Herman was from the LA area, from Glendale near Pasadena. He was a high school legend and he was very, very popular. And that immediately generated uh, tons of publicity for the ball club. And, and Cobb liked to hire managers who were personalities. He wanted guys that, that uh, the, the sports writers liked and, and who would generate a lot of ink uh, for the ball club. And so he, he he went in that direction, although much later, uh, when they were connected with Branch Rickey teams with Brooklyn and then later with the Pirates, he really uh, kind of acceded to uh, Branch Rickey's wishes as far as a manager in the latter years of the franchise. There's three things we see in the game today that, that I think most people don't realize came from the Hollywood Stars. Um, the first, the California League. Um, the, the minor league out here on the West Coast was initiated by the Hollywood Stars. Uh, like teams at that time, uh, at the top levels, they were sending three, four players to Class C or Class D clubs. And uh, Cobb was a stickler for player development. He wanted to get away from buying big league players who were kind of in the latter stages of their career and, and really wanted to try and develop his own players that not only could, could help his club, but that could be sold uh, and, and be a source of revenue for his clubs. 
and he wanted to, to have a, a, a farm team that he could control, that he could put a manager in charge and they could teach it the way they wanted it taught and that he could put all of his players at and, and have control of. So he pitched the other five uh, owners of California-based uh, Pacific Coast League teams, and they launched in uh, 1941 the California League. In uh, July of 42, the shortage of players due to World War II uh, caused the league to go on hiatus. And then after the war, big league clubs really saw the, the benefits, the quality of the, the facilities and uh, the weather in California. And they jumped in with higher offers. And those owners that the Coast League guys that actually put in place ended up taking the offers from big league teams and the Coast League clubs got forced out. Uh, Cobb then uh, turned to his adopted hometown. He was raised in Billings, Montana, and he created uh, the Billings Mustangs, a similar concept to what he did in Hollywood, bringing some celebrity investors in and, and locals, and, and they upgraded the American Legion Park, which in gratitude, the city renamed Cobb Field, and uh, the Billings Mustangs uh, had played in the Pioneer League up through last season, uh, so continues uh, to be a part of uh, professional baseball. Uh, grooming the infield. You see this now at every game, uh, middle innings, they pause and the ground crew comes out to groom the infield. Well, that was started by the Hollywood stars. Uh, in 1950, they had a pitcher who, uh, Jack Salveson was toward the end of his career. And he felt like to be effective, he had to keep hitters off balance and he, uh, liked to work fast. He would tell his catcher, as soon as you throw the ball to me, get back in the crouch. Cause it's coming right back at you. And on nights when he pitched, games were 30 minutes shorter in duration than any other game. And that meant that the, the stars were not making as much money at the concession stands. And so Cobb and his team, uh, his management team, uh, racked their heads to try to come up with a, with a solution. And they came up with the idea they wanted to, in some way, shape, or form, create a brief intermission. And uh, this was what they came up with, the idea to send the grounds crew out. And uh, they pitched it initially to the Coast League and the, and the Pacific Coast League turned him down. Uh, they appealed it and it was turned down again. They then went to the head of minor leagues who turned them down. And then they took it to the rules committee and the rules committee gave them the okay to test it out the second half of the 1950 season. Well, it went over so well that by 1951, just about every team in baseball was doing it. And it's been in the game ever since. The third thing is uh, that uh, traces to the Hollywood stars is Dodger Stadium, believe it or not. Uh, back in 1952, and this ties into the Orioles, the big league Orioles. Uh, back in 1952, uh, the chief of police in Los Angeles invited Bob Cobb to come up to the police academy, which was up there in the hills north of downtown Los Angeles. And he wanted to put in a, a kitchen uh, for a, a large cafeteria and also to potentially use for banqueting and also catering purposes. And he wanted Cobb's advice. And, and Cobb then, after the meeting, started walking around through the hills. And he was struck immediately uh, by a particular area, Chavez Ravine. And the next day, he brought a friend up. And they went over it together. They talked about how one day three different freeways were going to service that area. And they both agreed this was the perfect site for a ballpark. Well, at that time, uh, Cobb had two issues that were pressing. One, the Pacific Coast League had started in 1946 to press for uh, major league status. They wanted, as a league, to become the third major league. They wanted to become a big league. And uh, when Ford Frick became commissioner, he laid out criteria for all the different leagues. And for the Coast League, he, he had, Frick had said they weren't going to bring one or two clubs in as far as an expansion. It would be an entire league. And he laid out the criteria in terms of population, attendance, and quality of ballparks that the league had to meet. Well, the quality of ballparks was a, a real problem because uh, the Angels, the LA Angels ballpark Wrigley Field, uh, seated 25,000. It was pretty much a replica of Wrigley Field in Chicago. And that, that met major league standards, but none of the other parks did. So Cobb was thinking about building a new park and looking for places. And at the same time, his lease on Gilmore Field was going to expire at the end of the 1957 season. And Earl Gilmore was starting to have some difficulties. His oil wells were going dry. He was shifting his, his business more to land development and uh, was selling off parcels of his land. And so Cobb saw the writing on the wall that uh, he was probably going to be forced out and, and not given the chance to renew uh, Gilmore Fields' lease. 
and so uh, he became very sold on the Chavez Ravine. He, he hired uh, one of the area's more renowned architects, Stiles Clements, and they put together a, 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 a fabulous plan on a new ballpark. And it was about 25,000 seats at that time with an ability to kick it up to 45 or 50,000 for a major league club. It had two restaurants, it had a cocktail lounge, uh, child care, escalators that would come from the parking lots uh, up, up the hill to the, uh, to the uh, ticket offices and the, and the turnstiles. And it had what they called cabanas, which today we all know are uh, the suites, the skyboxes in ballparks. But back then it was an unheard of concept. And uh, this was just light years ahead of anything that baseball had seen at that point. Well, uh, Bill Vex started sniffing around Los Angeles. He wanted to bring the Browns to Los Angeles. And Cobb was alarmed by this for a lot of reasons. Um, Vec met with the County Board of Supervisors and pitched the idea that he would, if they would build a ballpark, uh, he would come to Los Angeles with the Browns. Um, and he talked to the city a little bit as well about the idea of potentially buying Wrigley Field and uh, making that the home of the Browns with some renovation work. Uh, that was problematic, though. It was really landlocked. Uh, and Cobb followed him to these meetings. He went to the city, the county board of supervisors first and, and urged them to ignore Bill Vec. And he said the Browns are not a good ball club. It's not what we want here. Uh, they're not well funded. And uh, he's not looking to sell. Uh, and the, he urged them to ignore Vec and to support the Coast League in their efforts to gain major league status. And ultimately, uh, it worked. They stopped listening to Vec. They told Vec they were not interested. And of course, uh, turned out the American League didn't want Vec either and pressured Vec to sign to the group there in Baltimore or to sell to the group there in Baltimore, which is what ended up happening. Um, and when the A's had to leave Philadelphia, that club went up for sale. Los Angeles was in the mix, uh, but it ended up going to Kansas City. And, and it brought a lot of the, the sports writers in Los Angeles to try and understand why. Why would Kansas City be the choice over Los Angeles? And one of the things they found was that everybody representing Los Angeles just went back and told tall tales. Nobody showed money. Nobody showed a ballpark plan. And so the mayor was skewered over this. Uh, he was just crucified in, in, the, the, in the press. And so the day after a, a, a particularly vicious column in the LA Times, he held a press conference and he said, I don't worry. I have a plan to bring Major League Baseball. And he, and he held up a brochure that Bob Cobb had actually produced for the city council. And he showed this great picture of this incredible ballpark. And he said, we're going to build a ballpark in Chavez Ravine. So in effect, the city stole Bob Cobb's plan and idea. And from that point on, uh, they had no interest in supporting the Coast League, uh, be it the Angels or the Hollywood Stars in their quest to gain Major League status. And they were entirely focused on bringing in a big league ball club. And in 1957, when Walter O'Malley made his first fact-finding trip to Los Angeles, he told all the city leaders he was not going to meet with any of them until he had first met with Bob Cobb. And uh, not long after uh, uh, O'Malley's plane touched down, he and Cobb met for two hours in uh, Mr. O'Malley's suite at the Stadler Hilton. And uh, at, o at O'Malley's request, uh, Cobb brought, brought all the blueprints and the, the drawings of this proposed ballpark and maps and showed him everything about Chavez Ravine. And at the end of the meeting, uh, O'Malley declared to the, to the writers that he had learned more in this brief meeting with Bob Cobb than he had from anybody who'd been pitching him on moving to LA over the previous several years. And he was locked in to Chavez Ravine from that point on. They tried to convince him to, to pl simply play in Wrigley Field. And then he said that was, that was a non-starter. And then they also talked to him about the idea of, of trying to make uh, the Coliseum a permanent home. And he said that was impossible. Um, there were no boxes. They'd lose money. The press box would need to be remodeled and relocated. And of course, the playing dimensions just uh, weren't going to work on a permanent basis. So following uh, the declaration that the Dodgers were coming to town, uh, that meant the Hollywood Stars and the LA Angels had to leave. The Dodgers had taken over ownership of the Angels and moved them to Spokane. And the Hollywood Stars ultimately were sold to a group in Salt Lake City, which ended Bob Cobb's uh, involvement with baseball. Other than being a, a fan of the Dodgers, uh, he was the one person that took out a full page ad when they won their first pennant and, and congratulated the team. Uh, he had a, set up a shuttle bus 
service from the Brown Derby to uh, the Coliseum those first few years. But then when Gene Autry got the expansion Angels, his allegiance shifted. He and Autry were close friends. Autry had been an investor in the Hollywood Stars. And Fred Haney, who had managed the Hollywood Stars, uh, became the first general manager of the Angels. And Cobb's allegiance shifted. And he was a, a, a season ticket holder, box seat holder, um, and uh, was out there often. But uh, quite a unique uh, and remarkable legacy and a, and, a, and a very unique team, one of the, the more special teams I feel in, in all of professional baseball's history. So I'm open to any comments, thoughts, or questions. Didn't Casey Stengel manage somewhere on the Pacific Coast League? He managed the Oakland Oaks, yes. Uh, he was from the Southern California area, from Glendale. Uh, he was very close with Fred Haney, and he, he brought the uh, Yankees out, actually, in 1951. Uh, first time they had, they had come out west for spring training in Phoenix. They switched camps with the Giants, and then they made a tour and came in and played three games uh, with Hollywood. Hollywood took two of the three, and it was the first time the Yankees had ever lost uh, to a minor league club. I believe that was one of the last seasons that was heading into DiMaggio's last season and one of the first seasons of, uh, of Mickey Mantle. Uh, this Tom Steeds, Dan, where was uh, Gilmore Field located and what happened to it? It, uh, it became, for a year, it became a kind of a training ground for the Rams football team, and it was torn down. Uh, it was in the Fairfax district, which is just kind of on the fringe of Hollywood. Uh, so the, uh, if you know Los Angeles, uh, a big area, kind of a tourist thing as well as the, far the original farmer's market. And the Gilmore family still owns that. And that was right next door to Gilmore Field. Gilmore Field, uh, what stands on the site now is CBS. Uh, their big television city complex. In fact, in one of the studios, I'm told that the Sabre group out there uh, got a marker made and, and was able to get in and place it very close to where home plate was in Gilmore Field. Interesting. How, how long, you mentioned uh, Cobb had uh, continued as a Angels fan and uh, was involved with their interested in them. How long, how much longer did he live? Um, how old was he when he when he got into this wheeling and dealing in the stock? <laughs> I'd say he was in his forties. Uh, he died in the early seventies of cancer. Um, there was a lot of push by uh, sports writers and columnists. Uh, to convince Walter O'Malley to make him a part of the Dodgers when they came West. And, uh, and he said, no, his, his standard line was, I've got my chili parlors to run. Um, and, and he didn't want to be involved uh, anymore. And I don't know, I've taught his grandson's become a good friend. We've talked about it. And he really doesn't know why his dad didn't want to continue. Or his grandfather didn't want to continue being involved in baseball. Um, there was some question as to whether, uh, cause Gene Autry, brought a whole group of investors around him uh, when he started up the Angels. And there was some question as to whether Cobb would be involved. And he accepted a role as a, a, a volunteer head of community relations for the club, but uh, uh, never an investment stake. So he was just happy to be a fan for the rest of his days. Mm -hmm. I think during the years you mentioned, they were affiliated, the Stars were affiliated with the Giants at least one season, the White Sox and the Dodgers and the Pirates. Is that correct? And then that some years they were unaffiliated? Well, the 48 season, uh, I'm sorry, the 38 season, right before Cobb purchased them, they were tied in with the Browns. And then uh, they had uh, for a couple of seasons with the White Sox and a season with the Tigers. And they were always frustrated because uh, if you do how those deals were at the time, you know, you get maybe four players, but they get first shot at any players that you had, that you had under contract. And so they, Cobb always felt that it was one-sided and it, it wasn't beneficial to the club. In 1949, uh, you know, they, at the end of the 48 season, they fired Jimmy Dykes as their manager. He'd been there for three years. And they really felt like 
he was just depositing a paycheck and waiting for his next big league call. And so late in the season, they fired him. And they ended up bringing on uh, Fred Haney as their manager. And he was very popular locally. He'd been their radio broadcaster after being fired as manager of the Browns. And he was extremely popular. And Haney said he would only take the job if he had control over the roster. And he was adamant that he wanted to create a, a much better uh, relationship with a big league club. And he went after Branch Rickey. And so in 1949, they, they were aligned with the Brooklyn Dodgers for three seasons. And uh, Haney had insisted that the players had to be young players. They had to be athletic. They had, he wanted to play a running game, so he wanted players that were fast. And he didn't want Ricky sending him over the hill big league guys. And so they had Irv Noren and a number of players that, that ended up getting going up to the run their way up and went to the big leagues. 49, Noren was the Coast League MVP. And the next year he was in the big leagues with Washington. Um, and so they were with Ricky for about three seasons. And then when Ricky went over to the Pirates, Bob Cobb had become extremely close friends with Ricky. He, uh, he was very wary of the, of the relationship at first. He'd heard a lot of bad things about Ricky and didn't initially really want to do the deal with him. But Ricky won him over and they became great friends. I mean, Cobb was a competitive skeet and trap shooter, competed in the national championships. And uh, he and Ricky would go uh, hunting in the off season up to Montana. Uh, they would go deep sea fishing to Florida. Uh, they became the best of friends. And so he followed and they, they broke the contract with Brooklyn when Ricky went to uh, Pittsburgh and they were uh, from what, 53 on till 50 through 57. They were a Pirates farm team. And at the end, the, the final season, 1957, Ricky had been uh, forced out in Pittsburgh and they made him the chairman of the board of the Hollywood Stars. So, it was a very close association uh, with Branch Rickey for those eight years. Who would you say was the best player that ever played for the Stars? You mentioned Irv Norton. I know Dale Long played for him. I'll give you two answers on that. Uh, the first, because the earlier, uh, someone caught me, tripped me up on an earlier uh, talk on this one. So I'll be fully accurate. The first version of the Hollywood Stars that Bill Lane owned and ultimately moved to San Diego, they had Bobby Doerr. They had signed him as a 16-year-old out of Fremont High School in Los Angeles. Under the Bob Cobb team, their lone Hall of Famer was Bill Mazeroski. Uh, you mentioned Dale Long, yes. Uh, they had Dr. Strangelove. Dick Stewart was an infamous uh, member of the 1957 club for about six weeks. Um, and the story behind that, which I thought was kind of fun, was Steve Bilko owned Los Angeles. He was this tremendous power hitter for the Angels, Huge fan favorite. Well, uh, Stewart had hit 66 home runs the year before, and uh, the Pirates shipped him to, uh, to Hollywood. And they were ecstatic. Cobb and company, they were just ecstatic to get him because they thought, now we've got a guy who can rival Bilko, and we're going to uh, take the attention away from the Angels and from Bilko. And, uh, and Stewart got off to a great start. I think he hit three home runs in his first two games. And then the pitchers figured him out and he couldn't, he couldn't adjust. And they were getting him repeatedly on high fastballs, but he got a lot of attention while he was there. And he got a couple of uh, bit parts in movies and uh, that were lined up. And uh, Jane Mansfield had been in 1955, Miss Hollywood stars. They had a beauty pageant every year. And she was around the ball club a lot in 56 and 57 as well. And she approached Stewart one day before a game. And she said, how come your name's always in the paper and mine's not? And Stewart looked down at her and said, because you didn't hit no 66 home runs. <laughs> but yeah, and Babe Herman, of course, a huge name uh, uh, it, from their early years. And, and he won a PCL batting title one year. And, and uh, the most popular guy was a guy named Frankie Kelleher, who they bought from the Reds during World War II. I think it was in 43. And he was a real quiet guy, but a big home run hitter, averaged 30 homers a year. And uh, the only player they retired, uh, who got his number retired when he when he finally retired from the Stars. Gus Zerniel was another one. He had a big year in 48 before going up to the big leagues. Those would be some of the bigger names that played for the Stars. Uh -huh. Thank you. Sure. sure. I have another question. It's got to be 40 years ago. I read a book by Adele Rogers St. John who was the daughter of Earl Rogers, who was a famous Los Angeles criminal attorney. 
back around, I think, the turn of the 20th century. And in the book, it's uh, one of the sides she had was growing up, she remembered going to watch the Hollywood stars with her dad in the famous pennant race. Uh, in your research, did you go back that far? Well, the famous pennant race was 49, and uh, they battled San Diego. San Diego uh, had aligned. Uh, Cleveland had approached, Beck had approached Hollywood following the 48 season and wanted to do a deal, but he wouldn't guarantee that he would keep the players there all year, and, and Cobb really wasn't interested. He, he, he was concerned about the fans, and also he was going to hire Fred Haney as the manager, and uh, Beck wanted to put his own guy in there. So Vec ended up aligning with the Padres, and he sent. It, it was a it was a tremendous ball club that he had. Al Rosen was there. Minnie Minoso was there. Um, Luke, Luke Easter. Luke Easter was there. In fact, um, they told me stories about how there's there's a ball called I think it's called the '66, and it's a real lively ball that, that can be used a lot of times in batting practice. And the Padres would open that ballpark up early, and they would use just these '66 balls, and Luke Easter would just put on an unbelievable show in batting practice. So they were they were loaded. And uh, so the two of them, Hollywood got off to a great start. They were out in front most of the season. Uh, Haney, though, really never gave his, his, his eight regular position players a night off. And so when they got into August, the injuries started to pile up. And they started to fade. And San Diego overtook them briefly. Oakland... Uh, Chuck Dressen, I believe, was the manager uh, at that time. And, and they came on fast and really closed the gap. And it got real tight down the end. And then true to what Bob Cobb worried about, Bill Veck brought up Al Rosen and Luke Easter and a couple of other players. And the Padres fell apart late. And so Hollywood was able to, to win it uh, the last week of the season. And uh, back then they had a Shaughnessy playoff and, and Hollywood breezed through it to win. But it was it was a heck of a pennant race that year. Luke Easter has record for the longest home run ever hit in Municipal Stadium in Cleveland. Went 477 feet into the upper deck in right field in 1951. Wow. I, uh, they tore I, down the, the, the ballpark to build the football stadium. Okay. There's a there's, the Buffalo Evening News ran a story on on a, a infamous Luke Easter home run in Buffalo back in the day, and uh, Gail Henley is is a friend. He's in his early 90s. He played for Hollywood, and at that time was playing for Columbus. And uh, Luke Easter's Buffalo home run record uh, was hit against Columbus. And I, I asked Gail, and he goes, "I remember it like it was yesterday." He said, "I thought I was going to catch it." He said, "I kept going back and thinking I had a beat on it." And it just kept going up and up and up. And the next thing I know, it sails over the, the, the batter's eye. And the story was it, it, it ended up across the street on the second floor balcony of a, uh, of a two-story home across the street. The, the woman who owned the home thought her, her home had been hit by a bomb. And uh, I guess her grandson ran up and got the ball. But uh, Luke Easter was an amazing, amazing power hitter. Yeah, he was. So uh, in... You didn't do any research back to the early 1900s for the Hollywood uh, stars? Well, I, I did because uh, the origins of the Hollywood stars actually were the old Vernon Tigers who began in uh, 19... I think they began the second year of the Coast League. Was that 1918, 1917? Um, uh, Mayor, Fred Mayer, who was a, a, owned a big brewery, uh, wanted to get into the to the game because he felt like that would help beer sales. And on opening day, he suffered a severe appendicitis attack and died at the hospital that night. Uh, his son took over and he tried to bring a lot of celebrities around, but really didn't know what he was doing. And they had a, they had some real good ball clubs. I mean, they had a tremendous uh, uh, Bob Musil played for them before going to the big leagues, and they won the Little World Series uh, one particular year, and I can't remember who they played. Uh, from the International League, but uh, yeah, they, they had a tremendous ball club, and I can't I can't think of which year that was to be honest. Um, so yeah, I, I did research the Coast League and and the origins of the of the club, and then ultimately they were uh, the Mayor family. Uh, Prohibition put a wrench in their in their business, and they ultimately sold the ball club. And uh, Herb Fleischhocker, who was a banker in San Francisco, bought them, brought them up to San Francisco. 
and uh, they they just could never uh, unseat the seals of San Francisco's team. And they were the Mission Bells for a time, the Mission Reds for a time, and and sharing the stadium with the seals. And and they really never made much of a dent in that market. And that's why in, in '38 they ultimately moved to to Los Angeles to try to make a go of it there, and didn't. Interesting. Uh, when the Hollywood team would play the Los Angeles Angels, where did the players live, and then they, how did they commute between the ballparks? Well, a lot of them lived in the in apartments that were within walking distance of the park. Um, uh, my last book was on the legendary scout George Genovese, and George became a wonderful friend, and he played for. And it was kind of the genesis of this book because George played for Hollywood in '49, and then again in '51. And uh, and would tell me great stories about his time with the club and and draw uh, you know draw connections from some of these innovations to the Hollywood stars, uh, but George talked about it that a lot of them lived uh, in apartments that were you know, not too far from the ballpark, and they would walk over to a restaurant called Dupar's, uh, which is still today in the farmer the farmers market where they they'd have a meal and then walk on across the street to to uh, to Gilmore Field for pregame. Uh, so when they played the Angels, I've talked to guys that were that played for both the Giants and the and the Dodgers, and and ultimately played for either Hollywood or for the Angels, and they all agreed, as as intense as the Giant Dodger rivalry has been through the years, it had nothing on the Angels Hollywood rivalry. Uh, the brawls were intense, uh, not just on the field but in the stands. Uh, each team drew their biggest crowds of the year when they played one another. Uh, there was an infamous uh, 1955 incident when uh, uh, a melee broke out uh, in the first game of a doubleheader, and uh, the game was being televised live locally. And the chief of police happened to have just walked into his home, turned on TV, and sees this this melee going on on the field at Gilmore Field, and he gets on the phone and sends the riot squad out to break it all up. And uh, Chuck Stevens told the story that uh, between games of the doubleheader, he walked into the clubhouse and there's a guy in, in a suit standing in front of his locker. And he hollered at the, uh, at the uh, clubhouse manager and, you know, get this guy out of here. And the guy turned around and flashed a badge. And he was the sergeant in charge of the riot squad. And he laid out what the rules were going to be for the second game. No player other than the nine who were in the game could leave the clubhouse. And you could only leave if you were summoned to be a pinch hitter or uh, go in the game as a defensive replacement or to warm up in the bullpen. And they, the next game was incident-free. But uh, the next day, the, the uh, L.A. Angels switchboard uh, went crazy because in two weeks' time, they were going to play again over in Wrigley. And uh, the park was pretty much sold out within 24 hours of completion of the riot game. Who won? <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> the Angels, uh, when they showed up for their flight the next day, they were uh, they were sporting a lot of stitches and black and blue marks. And uh, yeah, uh, the Hollywood players. It, it was it was actually Frankie Kelleher who uh, everybody laughs about it because he was so quiet. His nickname was Mousy. And uh, the uh, the Angels pitcher kept throwing him high and tight, and finally uh, drilled him in the back. And uh, Kelleher just simply dropped his bat and very calmly walked to the mound. And so calmly, nobody really knew what he was going to do. And when he got to the mound, he hauled off and he punched the pitcher in the chest with such force that all the accounts were that the guy flew in the air six feet backwards and landed on his keister. And the next thing you know, all the dugouts are emptying and uh, players that I talked to about it just said it, it was wilder than anything they'd ever been involved in, in before. Thank you. That was interesting. <laughs> Good question. Thanks, Tom. And, of course, uh, Tommy Lasorda has a little uh, infamy in Hollywood stars history. And uh, kind of to, to that point, uh, in 57, the final game that the Angels and Hollywood played, Tommy Lasorda was pitching for the Angels. And the star's second baseman, Spook Jacobs, came up, and Lasorda kept throwing at his head. So Jacobs pushed a butt up the first baseline, and Lasorda came over to field it, and Jacobs took him out and just started pummeling Lasorda. And, of course, the, the dugouts emptied, and they had a melee on their hands. So Tommy Lasorda has a place in Hollywood Stars history as the instigator of the last-ever brawl between the Hollywood Stars and the uh, Los Angeles Angels. 
were most of the stars uh, games played uh, at night. I, I'm unfamiliar with really the scheduling. I'm sure most of them were at night. Were all of them at night? Uh, pretty much. Uh, the Coast League at that time had a unique schedule. They played seven game series over six days. Monday was always your off day, your travel day. And then Tuesday through Sunday would be your series. And Sunday would be a doubleheader. And this was consistent with every club. Uh, Hollywood, you know, when Cobb bought the club, they experimented a little bit with start times. But he wanted to, during the week, the games were, were night games. They uh, often would play a Saturday kind of a twilight game, and then Sundays would, would be day doubleheaders. Uh, during the war, though, in along the West Coast, there were blackout rules that affected many of the Coast League clubs, and they had to play day games. And Hollywood tried to push it as late in the day as they could. They experimented with a lot of different times through 42, uh, and I think they came up with the 3 o'clock start times. Uh, but it, it, was, it was a struggle uh, through the war years. That concept of the six-game series sounds like a bit of a forerunner of what the minor leagues are going to be doing this year, except for the doubleheaders on Sunday. That's right. Absolutely. That, when I saw the schedule announced uh, last week, I, I thought, here we go, the, the, the uh, influence once again of the Pacific Coast League on baseball, because that's, uh, that's the way they were, were scheduled back then. And yeah, that note that was just posted, thanks for that. Uh, that was the previous version of the Hollywood Stars, and they signed Bob Musil. Uh, uh, he was a 16-year-old at Fremont High, and what an amazing talent. And he came right in and and uh, won a starting job right away and, and had a big, big year. And then once they, they moved to San Diego, he was then purchased off the Padres by the Boston Red Sox. Or I should say, uh, not Bob Musil, uh, <laughs> Getting my names mixed up there, but Bobby Dore. Guys, anybody else? Questions for Dan? Comments? Dan, when's the book coming out, you said? Three weeks? It'll be out March 10th. Lights, camera, fastball, how the Hollywood stars changed baseball. And it's on Amazon, it's on barnesandnoble.com, and also the publisher, Roman and Littlefield. Okay. How long did you work on that? A couple of years. A couple of years. But it was a lot of fun. I, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a roller coaster ride of emotions. I think I mentioned, you know, George Genovese being the, the, the genesis of it. And one of his great friends, a guy named Artie Harris, who was one of the scouts in the movie Moneyball, uh, Artie grew up just a few streets over from Gilmore Field. And spent, as he said, 100 nights a year there. And so he had great stories, great connections uh, with people that grew up in the neighborhood. Uh, as I mentioned, in May of 48, Babe Ruth came out to visit. Uh, he, he came to Los Angeles. He was going to consult uh, on the uh, the beginnings of production on, on the movie about his life. And the first night in town, he came out to Gilmore Field and took in a game. And I've talked to two people who were pretty young kids at that time. One was sitting with his dad directly behind Babe in the boxes and, and talked. To, I asked him what his impressions were and he said, I couldn't understand. It was a really warm day and he was wearing a heavy overcoat and a flat cap. And he said, years later, it, 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 it kicked in. I realized how sick he was and that that's one of the reasons he was dressed the way he was. But that guy and another guy that I talked to to this day still have as a cherished possession the baseball they got signed by Babe that afternoon at Gilmore Field. Well, he died in August '48, so that was just three months before he passed away. Exactly, exactly. It was his last last trip to the West Coast. They, he and his wife, his daughter, and son-in-law came out on the train. Uh, and they only stayed just a few short days, but it, it coincided with the beginning of filming uh, of the movie. Now, with, with the... he, he, and Joe, he and the actor Joe E. Brown were great friends, and Joe E. Brown was around the stars a lot. And, and Babe came out in previous years and uh, was with Joe at games. Joe was really, to me, Joe was one of the more amazing uh, stories that I learned about through this because uh, he was an incredible sports fan and, and he had an amazing memorabilia collection. I mean, he had... Uh, the glove, I think it was the glove that Gehrig used in his final game. He had a bat that the bat that Ruth swung when he hit his 60th. He had all kinds of amazing memorabilia. 
and and it was all lost uh, in a terrible uh, one of these you, that you see these fires we get in California. Uh, it was a it was a, a brush fire that broke out, and the the winds blew it into Joey Brown's neighborhood and it burned down his home. Uh, just prior to that, he had a two thousand ball autograph collection, and uh, he had just donated that to UCLA. Uh, but yeah, all the memorabilia that he had the bats, the jerseys, and and whatnot were lost. And uh, to your point uh, on that message, yes, his son Joel. Um, Actually, his second job in baseball, he had a season as the PR director for the Hollywood Stars, and they were they wanted to make him the general manager the following year, but Ricky had other plans for him and took him to one of the other clubs in the Pirate organization. But uh, and and Joe E was a, a really remarkable guy because during the war, out of his own pocket, he traveled all over the world to entertain troops, and and the Stars worked uh, with a created an equipment drive that the Sporting News jumped on. And it was a used equipment drive, and they, the stars had nights where they asked people to, to bring bats and balls and gloves, and they were all donated to, to Joe E. And Joe took them around uh, to military installations all around the world and donated them so the troops could play ball. Quite a remarkable man. He was originally from Ohio. I think he grew up in Chillicothe. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, that, that name does sound familiar. Right. Uh, Dan, I had a question about Gilmore Field. Were there any yes. unusual aspects or quirks about Gilmore Field compared to its other Pacific Coast League? No, it was pretty. It was the dimensions and all were pretty standard. Uh, I'm a little surprised at, at where they, 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 you know, today you wouldn't see a big, tall scoreboard in center field, you know, with with the, the rules and, and the batter's eye there. But it was just kind of off, a uh, little little off center. Uh, but it, it was it was pretty, the, the only unique part of it was they really wanted to make it fan friendly, so it was tight. It was very compact. Uh, you know, Chuck Stevens played first base, and he told me that you know most foul balls you didn't even bother to try for because they were going to be in the stands. Uh, it was very tight. I want to say off the top of my head, I'd have to go back and look at my notes. I want to say that from first to the first row of the stands was 12 feet, uh, <laughs> but it may have been 16, and I think it was. Might have been 24 to the backstop, but it was it was very compact. Was was that done intentionally? Yes, or? yes. Cobb wanted it to be real fan friendly. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't like a landlock situation uh, where they didn't have the room, and which is usually, you know, I think that uh, what I've learned about a lot of these quirky ballparks, um, uh, the dimensions were because they were landlocked and they just didn't have the room to have normal dimensions. That wasn't the case with Gilmore Field. <laughs> It was just in the in the design of the park. Cobb wanted fans to be close to the action, and that's the way he commissioned the architects to do it. Yeah, as a, as a follow up to that, was it so? Did it play more? Was it more? Was the ballpark more helpful for the hitters, or the pitchers, or or it was more? It was or was it more neutral? Well, I think it was it was it was neutral. Um, it was not necessarily a power hitters park. Um, I mean, you could hit home runs, but Wrigley was the power hitters park, especially to right and right center. Um, but no, uh, Gilmer was not necessarily a power hitters park. Um, but if you were a running team, and, and that was one of the things that, that uh, uh, Haney liked about it, you know, it was a gap hitters park, uh, pretty good sized gaps. I can't recall the dimensions offhand, but I mean, it always struck me that the dimensions weren't anything unusual. And I never heard anybody of all the different players I talked to during, during the project, you know, none ever brought up the issue of dimensions of the park, uh, you know, being good or bad. Um, but it, their pitching was their pitching was pretty good. They had what three different 20 game winners. There were a few no hitters uh, during their, their pennant year. I think three of their four starters were knuckleballers. Um, so, but yeah, it was, it was, I wouldn't say it was a power hitter spark, but, um, you know, a pretty straightforward, good ballpark. And in terms of, uh, affordability, as far as tickets went, how did they, how did give more feel as far as ticket affordability compared to its other Pacific Coast League teams? It was very comparable. I mean, some of the, some of the, uh, amenities like cushions and programs, they charge double what other clubs did, like a dime instead of a nickel that sort of thing. But in terms of tickets, I've seen the prices and yeah, they were all pretty comparable to what everybody else did. 
I, but as far as the, the the box seat season tickets, I I don't recall what those figures were. Uh, but the celebrities were paying it, so. <laughs> Thanks. What was the capacity of the ballpark, and when was the last game played there? Uh, the capacity was 10,000. Uh, the, the first thought Cobb had when the major leagues came in and said, you know, your parks have got to meet, and I can't remember what the seating capacity was, 25. Cobb wanted to, to see if they could build uh, bleachers and stands around the outfield fences, and Earl Gilmore wouldn't have it. Uh, he turned it down, uh, so it was never really pursued. Um, their last game was, uh, they finished, they finished on the road in Seattle. Uh, it was late September of 1957 was their last game. And the final game, uh, the pitcher came one out from throwing a no hitter. What was, what was the last game at Hollywood or at the ball, on Gilmore field? Uh, that would have been September of 57. There was no baseball after that. Um, I can't think of the actual date. Um, I know they honored Bob Cobb. Uh, they surprised him. Um, the Chamber of Commerce did before the game. Uh, and he broke down in tears. Uh, but, yeah, I can't remember the actual date of the game. But, but it was a Sunday, and then they went on the road after that and finished up uh, in, the, in the Northwest. Dan, I, I looked up uh, here. I knew I was headed somewhere. This first, I think it was one of the first editions of Philip Lowry's book, Green Cathedrals. In Gilmore Field, uh, the dimensions were the foul lines were 335 feet. Um, the uh, power alleys were 383. Center field was 400 feet. And the backstop is listed here as 34 feet. Behind. Okay. Okay, so the, got it. So I guess the foul lines were, uh, it would have been symmetrical, 335 feet down the foul lines and 400 feet to center feet. Thanks for looking that up. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess when you've got knuckleballers, you don't want that ball to roll very far. Was the ball known to travel there? Uh, you may have said that to Stephen while I was looking well, at it. It wasn't cons it, it, Wrigley Field, where the Angels played, was considered a uh, a power park, particularly the right and right center. That's that's the park where they filmed Home Run Derby. Uh, yeah. In fact, Mark Scott, who was the host of that original Home Run Derby, was the Hollywood Stars radio announcer. Uh, his daughter helped me in in the project, and we stay in in contact. Uh, but Wrigley was not necessarily your typical power park um and i'm not sure how the winds played in that part of la at night uh i know they had i know they had a few games where fog rolled in uh, late in the season but uh yeah it, it was it didn't play as a power park They had two players cleared the center field. Two or three players cleared the center field scoreboard in the 20-year history of the park. Luke Easter was one, and they had a uh, one of their young signings, a guy by the name of Bill Gray. And Bill Gray, growing up, had been Ted Williams, perhaps his best friend. And uh, Bill Gray, I uh, talked to Bill Gray's daughter about it, uh, uh, Gray's mom, like Ted Williams' mom, they were in the Salvation Army, and they often were in Mexico uh, trying to save souls. And so Gray and Williams, uh, kind of latchkey kids, you could call it, and spent their, their free hours playing ball. And uh, Gray came up initially to play uh, football at UCLA, was a lineman with uh, Joe E. Brown's two boys, Don, who was killed. He was a, a bomber pilot in World War II, and Joel, who was the younger, and then uh, Gray elected to uh, play ball, and, and Hollywood signed him. And when he came back from the war, he was just one of those guys that uh, they, they, they were really going in a heavy emphasis on player development and raiding the high schools of juniors. And World War II really, uh, uh, a lot of these guys came back injured or uh, you know not as inclined to play ball, wanting to get on with their life, and Gray was one of them. 
but yeah, he's... yeah the... go Steve. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Gilmore Field. How much did that cost to build? Two hundred thousand. So the the club put up a hundred, and Earl Gilmore, the oil man who it was named for, and whose land it was built on, he put up the other hundred, and he supervised the construction. Uh, and you you mentioned a little bit about recruiting uh, locally. How successful were? How would you say was a fair percentage as far as how many of their players that they've had over the years, whether it's through within the Pirates organization, or whether it's before, before they made were Pirate affiliate. How much of there was was local, considering the wealth of California area colleges and high schools, colleges and universities? Well, when Cobb bought the ball club, that was one of the things that he he made a priority was player development. And just as you said, he knew that. And 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 in addition, Steve, one of the unique things about Southern California was their semi-pro ball. I mean, semi-pro ball in Southern California was massive. And you had big league guys that were recruited to play on company teams. You had high school talent. Uh, and every park in Southern California was filled on weekends with semi-pro ball. Uh, and Cobb knew this very well. And so they started out going after that that young talent. And they uh, – I'll get a little long-winded here. I apologize. But uh, uh, one of the things they, they studied, uh, Cobb and his business manager, a guy named Oscar Reichow, studied the – there, at that time, there was a, 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 an agreement between the commissioner's office and the National High School Federation. And it stipulated that high school players could not be signed until 30 minutes after the conclusion of their graduation ceremony. Well, as Cobb and Oscar Reichel got reading this, they realized that only pertained to big league clubs, not minor league clubs. So they started, they knew that if they waited until those kids graduated from high school, now they're in a bidding war with big league clubs. And they were never going to win a, big, a bidding war with big league clubs. They only did once. So they started going after high school juniors. And they got, in 1940, they got uh, the, the, the high school football player of the year and the high school baseball player of the year to sign. Uh, Eddie Harrison was the football guy, heavily recruited by a lot of major schools. But his family was having financial troubles, so he signed. And he was 17 years old, and he started right away in left field. Uh, they signed the uh, the high school pitcher of the year, Bill Beresoff. Um, and and uh, they, they ended up farming Beresoff out. And then Beresoff came back after the war with a bum shoulder, and they released him. And he only pitched, one, I believe, one game, one or two games for Hollywood. Uh, in 41, I think it was, they signed, uh, oh, gosh, uh, Clint Hufford, a right-handed pitcher. Uh, they thought he was the next Bob Feller. They were ecstatic to get him. He was a junior. I talked to Clint before he passed away, and he said that the next morning after he signed, uh, both a Yankee scout and Dodger scout came to his dad's gas station and berated them both. Uh, they were having such an impact that way that the Angels sent their scouts out. Dutch Ruther, the former big league pitcher, was their primary scout, and they sent Dutch Ruther out to the high schools to do assemblies to tell the high school baseball players to ignore the Hollywood stars and wait until they graduated. Uh, but they, they had some really good success with young players. Carl Cox was an infielder. Todd Davis was a strong arm shortstop who got to the big leagues with Philadelphia. Um, they were having some really good success. And then the war came and all of these young players ended up being conscripted and fighting in the, in the war. And some of them came home injured like Beresoff did. Uh, Carl Cox uh, came back with malaria. Uh, some of them, like uh, Eddie Harrison, just wanted to get on with his life and get into business. Bill Gray, similarly. Uh, Clint Hufford uh, was trying to fix something in his home, fell off his ladder, landed on his right shoulder, end of his career. So, And then after the war, uh, baseball kind of turned a blind eye during the war years on the signing rules. Because a lot of the Angels even signed a 15-year-old catcher, Bill Sardi, during the war. So, but coming out of the war, they tightened that that rule up. They eliminated the loopholes, and and you couldn't sign uh, high school under underclassmen after that. So, uh, Hollywood got away from it. They they tried. I mean, they, they had good scouts. Rosie Gilhausen, who's a scouting legend, I think he signed ultimately George Brett, Brett Saberhagen, among others. He was his first baseball job was as Hollywood's head scout uh, coming out of the war. He worked in an aircraft uh, factory down there, and. Uh, 
uh, you know, he was he was a prolific scout. So uh, there were always maybe four through the pirate years. There were always uh, four or five guys that uh, that Gilhausen had signed, and of course the Pirates had first first dibs on. Um, and aside to that, not to be overly long-winded, Steve, but um, Hollywood gets a lot of criticism for being one of the last teams to integrate. And and my research, I, I found it really interesting that. Um, in January of 49, in January every year, they would hold a big tryout camp. In January of 49, they held this camp at Sawtell Field, which is now Jackie Robinson Stadium where UCLA baseball plays. And uh, there was a, a, an all-black semi-pro team in Los Angeles called Gold's Eagles, and they were sponsored by the drummer in Count Basie's band. And uh, I've talked to guys who played against them and said they were phenomenal. Great talent, great guys. And uh, the coach of the team called Rosie Gilhausen. And he said, I got a couple of kids you need to come over and look at. So Rosie did, and he was really impressed with, in particular, with this young center fielder by the name of Eddie Moore. And Eddie Moore was a power hitting center fielder uh, coming out of high school in Los Angeles. He had actually originally gone to Tuskegee Institute to play football. But his dad died. He came home to help his mother, enrolled at Los Angeles City College. And uh, Gilhausen brought him out to the tryout camp, and, and Fred Haney loved him, and they signed him. They brought him into camp with the big league, with the, with the stars, I should say, and they, they recognized quickly that he was very raw, that he had great potential, but he was, not gonna, he was not ready for the Pacific Coast League. So they sent him to Billings. That was the first year of the Billings Mustangs. He was the first African-American player to play in the Pioneer League. And they had him up there for two seasons. His first season, if you look at it, his numbers were good. But his second season, his numbers were sensational. And that co the end of that season coincided with Hollywood's change from Brooklyn to the Pirates following Branch Rickey. Buzzy Bavese came in and, and, and replaced Rickey with the Dodgers. And Buzzy Bavese wasn't going to let Hollywood break that contract without compensation. And he pointed out eight young players that Hollywood had under contract that that he wanted as compensation. One of them, probably the, the, the most familiar name, was Norm Sherry, who later caught in the big leagues and managed the Angels briefly. Uh, Norm had been signed by Hollywood. He was Hollywood property. Uh, and one of the other players uh, that was given to the Dodgers as compensation was Eddie Moore. And Eddie Moore got quickly up to St. Paul. Uh, I talked to his roommate, Gar Myers, who said that he was the victim of a very bad beating, was really never the same, was released, went to Mexico, had some, some big seasons, uh, challenging for the home run lead, but uh, uh, didn't fulfill his potential. Uh, you mentioned about Bobby Doerr, how Hollywood found him, and you briefly mentioned about Bill Mazeroski. How did Hollywood find, how, did, how were they able to get uh, Bill Mazeroski? Well, he was pirates. He was owned by the pirates. Oh, yeah, I'm meaning that. I'm so sorry. they were, yeah. So they were, uh, and the question was where to put him. Um, as an 18 year old, actually, they had briefly sent him to Hollywood, and he was badly overmatched. And so that was very brief. Um, but that off season, he went and played. I believe it was in the Dominican, might have been Puerto Rico, but for some reason, I think he went and played in the Dominican, and he he really gained a lot of confidence playing against more experienced players. So he had a good spring, and as a 19-year-old, they started him off at Hollywood. And I talked to people who, who watched him play, and they said he was just sensational. His nickname was No Touch. He was so good with the glove. And young high school players loved to watch him and learn by the, the, the things that he did. I mean, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't catch on the pivot, on the double play pivot. He wouldn't catch the ball in the, the, the glove. He would trap it against the, the, the back of the glove, so it would just trap it so it would just fall into his hand and he could make the quick quick transfer and throw. Uh, they said he was just sensational. And so he wasn't there long. I want to say late June, early July. He, his hitting was improving as he went along, and that's when the Pirates brought him up. But he was one of those uh, great players that they benefited from the, uh, the connection with the Pirates organization uh, uh, to be able to have him. And, uh, you know, I think the rule previously, I think the, the practice previously had been that You'd get maybe four or five guys max from your big league club. When they went with the Dodgers, they were getting about a dozen. And when they were, went with the Pirates, uh, it was a lot more. It was almost, uh, you know, 18 of your 22 players uh, they were getting were, were actually under contract with the Pirates organization. Anybody else, guys? Ladies? 
um, about 110. Um, so I'll, we'll let Dan go if nobody else has any other questions. Reminder, we do have Sunday night. We're going to start a Sunday night chat starting this Sunday, um, 7 to 9 East time, just to hop on. I stole the idea, Steve, from uh, Connie Mack with their uh, weekend Mac chats. So um, instead of do it, we'll just do it monthly. And then on next Wednesday, we'll have our peeps at the P meeting um, with a presentation on uh, baseball bats. Um, what they endure, the gentleman Steve from um, the Minneapolis chapter will be presenting on his book. So, and I've heard his presentation, guys, and it's really interesting. Steve's yeah, so we're going to try to do three a month now. Uh, stay active. Um, I have not heard anything about Orioles regular season tickets yet. Um, I know some teams that you've seen, uh, major league teams said they're going to have start opening day. Uh, the Marlins said they're going to um, do 20%, uh, which is interesting, uh, the meme says, because why would they want to try to double their attendance during the pandemic? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, who knows what's going to go on here in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, you know, I don't know who has their vaccination yet. I'm still on the wait list, but hopefully you're going to get it in the next week or two. Same here, Ivan. Yes, Maryland seems to be having an issue where a lot of them are going to the DC suburbs and not going to the other counties as quickly. So, I'm lucky here in North Carolina. I've had both of mine. We still have problems, but it, you know, seems now to be a pretty steady flow of vaccines coming into the area, and I've had both of mine. I consider myself luckier Good. than most. So, but that's the, that's the upcoming schedule. You guys should have all gotten the, the Baltimore Chop newsletter. Um, it, hopefully the, you enjoyed it. I forget, how do we connect to the Sunday thing? Did we have to register for that? Uh, you should, it should be in the last email. There was an invite in there. Okay. I, I may have already registered, I just forget. <laughs> yeah, because the anything that's through the Sabre zoom um you have to register for now i think they're tracking it more than they did um but when we do uh anything if i set up through the museum um that's just a regular click link um, so and you guys have seen it looks like it's going to be august of 22 hopefully not uh be bumped again so, um uh i think that's about all the the news i have thank you dan Thank you, guys. It was great to get together with you. Yeah, Stay well. Look forward to, to reading it. Hopefully, it'll be carried here. Uh, which publisher is it? Roman and Littlefield. Okay. I don't know if they usually do a table or not at the convention. Yes, they do. They do? Okay. Yeah. Uh, since it's been several years since the convention, we none of us can remember. Um, <laughs> but, I have a uh, question. You know, hopefully, uh, they'll uh, have one next summer. Um, yeah. And, Dan, uh, uh, I, uh, did you give any of your background when you came on? Is I did. I did. My background's as a sportscaster, and now I'm working in corporate PR for a company that makes fitness equipment, and I'm on the broadcast team, television broadcast team for our local ball club here, the Fresno Grizzlies. Triple A, or where did they get bumped to? Low A from Triple A, Coast League yeah. down to the California League. Got Didn't it. go over too well here. No, What's my... Uh, my father-in-law lives in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina area, and the uh, Myrtle Beach Pelicans got bumped down from uh, high A Cubs affiliate to low A. Mm. What, what is the capacity of the Fresno Ballpark? <laughs> 12,000. Now it's a low A park. I was talking <laughs> to one of the workers there the other day. I asked if they're going to make a, the upper deck a water park or something. <laughs> Got to be the largest capacity low A ballpark in the world. I think you're right, and the truck. But you know, there's a couple things there. They're really in limbo because we don't know what our governor's going to do out here. Not getting into politics, but you know, they, they can't hold, they can't bring in fans. So uh, they're hiring. Everything they they need to do is is on hold until they get some clarity. And I was telling one of the guys recently. I said that might be the best part 
of having a park that's too big for your classification because if they say you can only bring in you know 10 percent of capacity okay we could bring in 1200 fans yeah. where most of the other clubs in the in the in the league are only going to be able to bring in you know 200 300 400 so uh, it, it may wind up being a, a blessing in disguise for them this summer we'll see I did get a call from my ticket rep, and he, he said they're waiting for directions from the state. The state, and don't forget, uh, uh, the, our the lovely mayor of Baltimore City has veto power over what goes on in the city. So, um, so even if the state says go ahead, he might say no. I want to wait longer. Oh wow! Post had an article yesterday about uh, one of the manufacturers of the Pfizer drug is uh, located next to the Johns Hopkins Bayview Hospital in East Baltimore. And the gov uh, Baltimore City Mayor wrote a letter to the president of that company asking if they could uh, produce 300,000 doses for the citizens of Baltimore. And apparently wrote back, can't do it. It has to go through the government, through the feds and the state. And I saw a press conference where Governor Hogan of Maryland said, "You can't jump the line. You gotta, you gotta stay your turn." Yeah. Oh, I found my link for Sunday night, so I'm all, I'm all set for that. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully, some of you guys will come on for the Ruth panel tonight. I think that's at five thirty or six. I forget. Six ten, I believe it is. Six ten. Okay. I know they keep changing the times a lot, but 610 is the last I heard. <laughs> well, the reason was that is, you know, the panel stuff is pre-recorded, but the, the things with the Q&As, they have to get those guys oh. participating in that lined up. Um, it was originally for tomorrow, we had Boog and, and uh, Brooks and, and Jim Palmer. They were trying to get Johnny Bench, but because of his schedule, it couldn't, oh, didn't jive. So, um, but well, we might make it tomorrow. We might make a, a run at them for uh, for the next Saber National Convention because I'm sure there'll be a, a, a panel on the, the 70, 69 to 71 Orioles. Oh, yeah. So is the video a replay of something that was prepared years ago? It was prepared within the last week or two. Oh, okay. It wasn't like from... Yeah, it's, no, it's recent stuff. So. It's not from 1975 or something, right? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's recent. So just like last, last night's was with... Uh, Rock Kabatko and the Orioles' uh, current manager. I mean, it was just filmed sometime in the last probably 14 days, if that. Okay. Yeah, I saw that, but I wasn't too interested in the Maryland sports. <laughs> yeah. So, well, the only thing we didn't have this year that we usually do when we have in person things was something on uh, pro football, either current NFL or the old Colts. So. But since we're the, as you know, the foundation is the, the house here for all Maryland sports. That's why we have to do. Um, no, I the, understand it. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand it. Yeah. So, um, but hopefully you guys will sign on tonight for the, the baseball uh, Babe Ruth panel. And um, thank yeah, you again, Dan. Thank you, guys. Look forward to yeah. seeing you hopefully in person when you come in 22. <laughs> out to I would community. love it. I would love it. That would be great. And um, guys, you're not a retreat. You need They'll probably have to do the virus by then. Yeah. <laughs> um, More than a few in 22. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, next year, the, the, we were looking for something to tie in Baltimore-wise. Um, since originally last year, it would have been the 25th anniversary of 2131 and Roots' first season, 100th anniversary in New York and that, that kind of stuff. So next year will be the 30th anniversary of the opening of Camden Yards. Um, and also the 75th anniversary of Jackie Robinson. So. Well, I hope MLB cooperates and makes the Orioles home during that time. Well, we've given the Orioles the dates. Uh, I've sent them to uh, people I know, including the, one of the executive vice presidents. So they are aware and hopefully they can lobby to uh, <laughs> hopefully line it up. They can, hopefully they'll have the waiver agreements out by then. That's oh, true. that's true too. Oh my gosh. They said that's probably a more bigger problem than the virus worrying about the CBA. That would be the worst if players go on strike in August 
July 31st, 22. No, I think they do it before the season. <sighs> so, well, if there's no other questions um, or comments, um, you guys know how to reach me. Yep. Email, Facebook, um, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I'll see you guys, hopefully, uh, for those of you tuning in, we'll uh, jabber Sunday night. There's no agenda for that. It's just... No, it's just ran just random chats. <laughs> so I, we won't record those, so that way they won't be on the internet if people say bad stuff about <laughs> management or owners or whatever. So, <laughs> well, the Seattle president that got that, that quit because of some comments he made. Yeah. Really? Seattle uh, yeah. Mariners. GM. Really? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I haven't read the. Any of the news reports exactly what he said, or it was or, something about comments he made on Zoom, uh, Zoom last month about uh, about Kyle Seeger, uh, possibly definitely being the last year of his contract because we, we can't afford him, so on and so forth. It was just like uh, something about manipulation of service time. It was just everything that's wrong with baseball labor. Negotiations right now. A lot of those guys have been opening their mouths or sending lewd pictures, and it's been coming out. So, yeah. just keep your uh, keep your social media stuff to yourself, I guess. <laughs> Especially if you're, you're you're in a high position. <laughs> okay. um, for, for those who are Orioles fans, today is Eddie Murray's 65th birthday. Yeah. So he qualifies for Social Security. <laughs> I'm sure he's doing pretty well otherwise, but yeah. Um, there is a signed Eddie Murray ball for uh, in the silent uh, online uh, auction that we got donated by the Major League Baseball Players Alumni Association. Um, other than that, thank you, guys. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Good to meet you all. See you in a few days. Hope we see you Take later. care, Dan. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.